Okay, so uh, we've got this jacket and uh, that's the term for the heat transfer. We also have flow in and out of the jacket. So we've got uh, our flow here. So flow in and out of the jacket. And we've got generally two different temperatures, TA1 and TA2. But of course, if your flow rate is high enough, we can imagine that these two temperatures become quite similar to each other. Right. Imagine that you are trying to cool down a reactor and uh, you use a low flow rate through the jacket. Then you can imagine that jacket is going to pick up a significant amount of heat and it will exit at a much higher temperature than it entered with. However, if you apply a higher flow rate, if let's say this was cooling water and you use a higher cooling water flow rate, then the exit temperature won't be uh, won't rise as much as in the first case. And the higher you make this flow rate, the closer this temperature will become to this temperature. There will still be heat exchange, right? Your, um, uh, between the reactor and the jacket, there will still be heat exchange. It's just that then you are using such a high flow rate through the space that uh, the energy change, uh, so the same energy change uh, may be occurring. But at a higher flow rate, uh, you have a smaller temperature difference uh, to keep the same energy change. So we can see that if we look at the heat transferred term, um, yeah, we don't have a nice version of that. Well, if we look here, uh, I guess here, if, uh, if we have the same energy, let's say this is the energy transferred, if this is the same, then if we use a higher value here for our flow rate, m dot, the mass flow rate on the jacket side, if that value is higher, then for this whole value to be the same, uh, this must be smaller. The temperature difference must be smaller. So as we use a higher flow rate, the exit temperature becomes approximately the same as the entry temperature on the jacket side. And then we can identify one jacket temperature, Ta. And so if we look back at our uh, driving force for the temperature, then the temperature difference here will be the single uh, jacket temperature Ta minus the reactor temperature T. And so that's what we would have here, right? So that would be uh, the energy transfer term. And there are still, uh, if you work through this, um, you have these extra terms and you can show all the simplifies uh, to this form. Uh, there isn't any approximation here. Well, the one approximation is this one. This is if you uh, say the flow rate is high enough. But after that, we just apply that in the, in the equation. So in our balance that we derived here, this was the balance on the jacket side, we applied um, uh, these developments. And then you'll find that in this case, um, all these cancel. So the ones cancel, leaving us with this ratio. And then uh, the denominator cancels with this here. Oh, the, uh, there is an approximation in that uh, if we say that this exponential, if this argument is small enough, um, we know e to the x, if x is small enough, then this is approximately the same as one plus x. So uh, that is one approximation. Uh, so this is the general balance. And then if you say this is small enough, for instance, if this flow rate is high enough, then this term will become small. And then we can um, we can rewrite this as one minus uh, UA over M dot CPJ. So applying the same as we have here. Uh, then the ones cancel, uh, leaving us with just UA over this, and then that cancels with this M dot CPJ, and it leaves us with that. So as the temperature goes up, um, that's what we get. Uh, Akim, uh, you have a question there? Yes, sir. I just wanted to confirm, you were saying when it came to the jacket, if the jacket flow rate is small, then the inlet, then the outlet temperature is greater than the inlet temperature. Is that right? Um, it depends. Uh, uh, if, yeah, if the jacket is cooling, um, then it's going to, that means it's, it's absorbing heat from the reactor. In other words, the reactor is hot and we are absorbing heat from the reactor. So yeah, your exit temperature will be higher. 
Uh, okay, thank please you. Please continue. Okay. Um, no, so that was it. Okay, sure. And there I was, uh, when I was saying higher, um, uh, of course, it's higher than in this case, right? Uh, it's very, uh, the temperature here is higher than the inlet temperature. So that's one uh, aspect of it being higher. Um, it's also higher than the case uh, when you use a higher flow rate. So if the flow rate here is higher, then your temperature difference will be lower. So this temperature, this exit temperature will be lower than the earlier case. Uh, maybe we should really do this in terms of some uh, proper labels. So if we write this as TA1, and I'm going to say comma one, the first case, and TA1 comma two, so the second case, and then similarly here, we can write TA, uh, TA2, comma 1, and TA2, comma 2. So in the first case where we have TA1 and, uh, uh, sorry, TA1, comma 1 and TA2, comma 1, in this case, uh, we have a low flow rate, then TA2, comma 1, uh, is more than TA1, comma 1. That's what we can say at that stage. Then when we consider a higher flow rate through the jackets, um, we've still got the same TAs here. So this doesn't change. TA1 is equal to TA, uh, TA1, comma 1 equals TA1, comma 2. Uh, but now uh, we'll get a different TA2, comma 2. And the temperature rise will be smaller because we are using a higher flow rate. So in other words, TA2, comma one, uh, TA2, comma two will be less than TA2, comma one. And TA2, comma two is still more than TA1, comma one, which is the same as TA1, comma two. Uh, so I hope that uh, that helps there. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments there? Uh, sir, I need help. But I need a bit of clarity on what you just uh, said. Uh, okay, shall I? Let's try and write this, uh, write it in this form. So we can say um, mass one, so the mass flow rate. So let's say here, mass flow rates. And let's just put some numbers in. So mass flow rate one equals, uh, maybe that's 10. And in that case, T1, comma 1, uh, TA1, comma 1. Let's say that's 300. And then let's say TA2, uh, comma 1. Uh, that's going to be a higher temperature. Uh, let's say that's 450. And then for the second, um, the second case, let's say we used M2 equals 100. Right, so our... Uh, second case, we use a much higher flow rate. And this time, we still have the same inlet temperature. Uh, so TA1, 2, that's also equal to 300, right? But now we've got a much higher flow rate, right? 10 times the flow rate. So we expect that TA2, 2 is going to be lower. And maybe it's something like only 350. So we are saying here, always the exit temperature is higher than the inlet temperature, right? We are entering at 300 in both cases here. We are always leaving at a higher temperature, whether it's 450 or 350. But in the case where we use a higher flow rate, it, uh, it will be the case that our exit temperature here um, won't be as high as it was in the first case. So just because we have a higher flow rate, the same energy transfer is happening, right? This uh, reactor can only give up so much energy. And remember, UA, right, the, um, the overall heat transfer coefficient and the contact area, those are, uh, those are not going to change with the flow rate on the side. Well, not significantly. Um, we do know on the shell side, if you change the flow rate, the overall heat transfer co coefficient does change slightly but it's also influenced by the thickness of the wall and the conductivity there, and it's uh, affected by the mixing inside here. So let's say uh, what's happening on the shell side doesn't change the overall heat transfer coefficient much. Then U and A are not going to change. Now, 
so let's say, it, and it's not exactly true, but let's say the the heat transfer, the the heat that the reactor is going to give up, um, that's fixed, right? So the same amount of energy is being transferred in both these cases where we have M1 and M2. Um, in the M2 case, we have a much higher flow rate, but still the same energy being transferred. Now, because it's the same energy being transferred, but with a different flow rate, then uh, if we look at our our heat transfer rates, uh, and yeah, here, we've got the same energy. So this whole thing is the energy transferred. This is the, uh, the mass flow rate. So if the mass flow rate is higher, then this temperature difference must be lower. So that's why we're saying here you have a... Uh, a lower temperature than in the first case. It's still higher than the inlet temperature, but it's uh, um, in in terms of comparing cases, it's a lower temperature. Uh, does that help? Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks. Okay, any other questions or comments here? Okay, um, so moving on here, we can also say if we keep increasing that jacket flow rate, let's say the flow rate becomes extremely large, then TA2 becomes approximately equal to TA1, and we can say there's just one temperature in the jacket TA. Okay, uh, so that was the point we reached there. We said Q dot equals UA TA minus T. So using this approximation for the exponential, you can show that your Q dot term in the case where your flow rate is high enough uh, will become this. And by the way, it's that one assumption that the flow rate is high enough. So because um, the flow rate being high also results in the exponential, in the exponent uh, being uh, small, right? Because that's the exponent. If your flow rate is high, then your exponent is small. Uh, so that's the one assumption. If your flow rate is high, then all the supplies and we get the simple form for our, um, our heat transferred. So we can replace the Q dot term by this one. Okay, so that's our new Q dot. So now we've done all the work of figuring out how to incorporate the addition of heat. So there are some approximations here, and if we can apply them, then that applies. If we can't apply them, then it's still fine. We can just go ahead and use this form of the balance. Um, so this part, uh, you can just retain this as e to the minus. So you can just retain this here. Um, then you'll need other information like your m dot and your CPJ. So if the problem gives you all this information, then you can just go ahead and use it. But if you are able to say that the flow rate is high enough, then it simplifies, then you only need a U and A. So the amount of information you need actually changes depending on what uh, assumption you can apply there. Okay. So that's our Q dot term. Um, and then we've still got shaft work. We know we just add the power from the motor. So you can just look on the motor quite often. The power uh, is listed there. So you can just use that as a number. Uh, this term, uh, we can write more simply. We uh, we can see it's the difference in enthalpy between the inlet and the outlet. So we can say that's simply equal to the integral of the heat capacity between those two temperatures. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, how we can write uh, that term now. And then if we replace that in our balance here, then you can see we're going to get this term. And so we can uh, solve this equation for xA now, right? You can take this term across, you can take this term, which is now equal to this. You can take that across, and then we're just left with Fa in times delta Hr um, uh, times xA. So we can solve for the xA now. Um, so we can just divide by Fa in uh, delta Hr, and we can see um, there's an Fa in here, which will cancel. There's no FA in over here, so we have to keep the FA in uh, down there. Okay, uh, any questions or comments on that? Oops. 
Okay. Um, and then one more approximation that can be applied here. Um, we're saying that generally speaking, this heat of reaction is temperature dependent. And we did do some, uh, some development around that. We showed how to get the temperature dependence. Um, now, if we say that the standard heat of reaction, so in other words, we know the heat of reaction at some reference temperature TR or T naught, if that um, enthalpy is much greater than this delta Cp uh, T minus TR, then we can make the approximation that uh, this is that the heat of reaction is not temperature dependent. So you'll find they often make this approximation in design that the heat of reaction, um, we just take the standard heat of reaction, and that often gives us uh, good enough answers. So that's the energy balance. Now, would the addition of heat incorporated? And if we don't have uh, any heat being added to the system, then of course, this term just falls away. In other words, um, in our energy balance, if we don't have a Q dot term, right, Q dot equals zero, then we're just left with um, this in the equation. So that becomes the balance. And, you know, take a minute to look at this equation. It, it's something quite surprising here, right? If you think about all the work we had to do in the earlier section, uh, we had to estimate the reaction rate and the volume and the conversion and, and all that. Now we have this relationship, which tells us the conversion in terms of the temperature only. In other words, we don't need the reaction rate. You can see the, there's no reaction here. Fine, we have a heat of reaction, but we know we only need stoichiometry here. Uh, up here, this is just the inlet flow ratio and uh, the heat capacities. So that's uh, not related to the reaction. So only the heat of reaction term is here. So this is telling us that there is a strict relationship between the temperature that our uh, mixture accomplishes and the conversion that it took to get there. Uh, so another way to look at it is if we are not adding heat, then the only reason for the temperature to be different here is due to the reaction. And then because we have the heat of reaction involved here and the heat capacities involved, then all this effectively tells us what the conversion must have been for us to accomplish this temperature in the reactor. Right, and uh, so think about that for a bit. Uh, I find this quite a surprising result, the fact that I can actually estimate a conversion purely in terms of a temperature difference. So it means if, if I have a, uh, let's say a CSDR running, and I don't know what the conversion is there, but if I just know the inlet temperature and the exit temperature, if I, can, if I just go ahead and measure them, then I can just look up my heat capacities and so on. And then that's enough to estimate my conversion. So I, I feel that's quite a, uh, quite a surprising result. Um, but that's the new information that your energy balance gives you. Your energy balance makes it possible to relate uh, the heat uh, evolved by the reaction, and it connects that with uh, the tendency for, temp for the temperature to change given that the heat capacities are these values and so on. So any questions or comments there? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, Freedom. Um, I'm I'm sorry, it's it's a very muffled. I can barely hear you. Uh, can you try moving closer to the mic or something like that? Can you hear me now, sir? Oh, that's much better. Thanks. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you uh, much better. I was asking about, um, I think you said it's the flow rate ratio. That one is quite confusing me. I think it's QI, that is multiplying the CPI. Yes, that one. Uh, yeah, this is a theta, a capital theta. Hmm. So let's look at where that came from. You said, what is it, sir? Uh, it's uh, the symbol here is a theta. It's it's not a Q. Um, let let's remind ourselves where that came from. Um, I'm just going to switch. Uh, 
And let's look, I think we first introduced it, yeah, I think in this section, um, I think it was in here. Nope. Um, we, I think where we just introduced that, um, was it the previous section? No. Uh, where we had that reaction, that's temperature, energy balance. First law must have been here. Um, we had that reaction A, A plus B, B. Do you remember that? Uh, here we go. So we said that we would like to rewrite all our molar flows in terms of component A. So if we just look at component A, are we happy with this? Uh, it's saying here the molar flow of A out is the molar flow of A in minus um, the amount of A that was converted, uh, right? Are we happy with this one? Uh, Freedom, I think you're on mute now. Yes. Okay. Then if we look at FA uh, or FB out, right? Uh, let's first write FB out in terms of, uh, let's just write FB out. Yes. Mm -hmm. One second. Okay, so let's let's write FB out here. So we know that FB out, so FB out, that's equal to FB in minus, and then we know that the amount of A that reacted is FA in times XA. So that's the amount of A that reacted. And then if we want to know how much B then reacted, we would say uh, times B over A. So the stoichiometric coefficients here, uh, B over A times FBN minus uh, XA. So that's what we expect in terms of uh, FB exiting. And then if we write this as Instead of saying FB in here, we can rewrite this as theta, and that's a capital theta B times FA in. Then we have it in terms of FA in. So we define our theta i's, like so we say theta i, theta i equals. F I in divided by F A in. So that's all it is. It's our definition for an inlet flow ratio. So we know that there's some uh, generally independent flow rate from F A in. So whatever our inlet flow rate is, we divide by F A in, and that gives us an inlet flow ratio. And we did that because if you have um, this definition, then it allows you to generalize all this. Then we can define a theta for each component. And we can define one for FA in as well, right? Theta A is a one. So that allows us to write a nice general equation like this. It's uh, FA in times theta I times that uh, minus that uh, stoichiometric ratio. Uh, and then we found that uh, we had that when uh, when we combined the terms here. Remember when we wrote um, H in minus H out, Fi out, then for the Fi out terms, we would use this expression, which is where the thetas come from. So, so that's the origin of the theta in our energy balance. It comes first of all from the basic stoichiometric balance. And then in the exit enthalpy terms, it uh, it appears in uh, through the fi out part. Uh, does that answer it, Freedom? I 
Thank you, Mr. Um, yes, sir. I think I see where it come, it's coming from. I just have to sit down and digest it through. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to go to this, uh, yeah, each of these steps. Uh, and in fact, there's uh, quite a heavy load in terms of all the theory you have to do uh, to uh, to actually start solving problems uh, in terms of the energy balance. So work through each of these sections. And then this part on theta i is under 4.4, .4, right? Okay. Um, any other questions or comments there? Thank you, sir. Thanks. Okay, so coming back here, so we were looking at addition of heat and we were here, right? So um, so this is the balance that we had. Um, and we said that the difference in these enthalpies that can be expressed in terms of the heat capacity. And this is strictly speaking, the form that we should be using in terms of uh, CP being uh, a function of temperature. But if, excuse me, if uh, CP, uh, CPI, if that's approximately constant, or if we have a good estimate for the average, if we can get the, the true mean value of CP uh, over this range, then we can just multiply that heat capacity by that temperature difference. And that's an approximation to that enthalpy difference. So we can rewrite the enthalpy difference in terms of CP here. And, uh, and then as we said, um, if your heat of reaction can be uh, taken at the standard conditions, then that's our uh, balance there. Okay, so having invested our minds into all that development for the energy balance, at last we come to some exercises. So here's a case, uh, look at a CSTR where we have this first order elementary reaction. We are given the kinetic rate constant, um, the inlet temperature, and it's pure A, right? And so think about how that simplifies our balance here, if it's pure A. So anyway, uh, we are given the heat of reaction. It doesn't say whether it's a standard heat or anything, but we can see we don't have enough information here to really get the temperature dependent one. So we'll just use this approximation that it's the standard heat is fine. Um, we want to know whether or not to use a heating jacket, right? Um, we do choose to keep a fixed temperature in the reactor. So we'll, uh, we'll fix the temperature and we are given the heat capacity of component A and we are told the heat transfer fluid circulates fast enough. So we've got one temperature TA and uh, we are given the overall heat transfer coefficient and the molar feed rate. So we want to know what's the conversion without heat exchange and then with heat exchange. And obviously we want to know there, do we get a much better conversion when we add heat exchange, right? That's the whole point of this question, right? That's in all this that we are talking about, we are talking, we, we want to know, well, we are, we are saying that we want to add heat because we want better reactor operation. So this exercise is for us to check that. So when we add heat exchange, do we get better conversion? Okay, um, and uh, we'll, we'll do some tutorial questions like this, but uh, let's just look at the solution that I've written here. So in this case, if, uh, if we are looking at case A, where there's no heat exchange, right? So we said, if we don't have heat exchange, then this, uh, this term falls away and we're left with this so-called adiabatic form. Right, adiabatic means you haven't added heat. So there's no heat added to the system, adiabatic operation, right? So this is the, uh, and sometimes we use the kind of casual language, we call this the adiabat. So that's the adiabat for our uh, reactor. So in, according to this adiabat, uh, that's the general form that we need. And if we look at this term, right? It looks all symbolic and this capital theta and everything. But now we've got pure A. So if it's pure A, then uh, we don't have any other species entering. So it's only A. 
So theta is zero for everything else that might be there. So it's just zero. There's nothing else entering. And uh, it's only one for A. So theta is just a one and it only applies to A. So we can rewrite that simply as CPA, right? So the summation theta I CPI, that's only CPA by the end of the day. And then of course, we've got T minus T in that's there and the heat of reaction. So the heat of reaction is given to us. The temperature is fixed. So we said that um, the we want to maintain an exit temperature of 321 degrees, right? So, so that's fixed. And, uh, and the inlet temperature is given to us. Uh, so we, we are given, uh, uh, yeah, the A enters at uh, 468. So notice here, this does cool down, right? You enter almost 500 degrees and you cool down all the way to 300 degrees. And if we look here, the heat of reaction is 45,000. So this is a strongly endothermic reaction. We are losing heat uh, during the reaction. So uh, if we just saw this alone, right? If we just noticed here, this is a positive number, we would say, yes, I expect the temperature to go down. So that's what we've got here. And if you look at the conversion that we've got, well, we've got everything we need. We just said we have heat of reaction and we've got the two temperatures so and the heat capacity. So we just need to stick the numbers in and we'll see we get a conversion of about 0 0.25. So that's what we get in adiabatic operation. Okay, now let's look at uh, what we'd get if we do add heat. Um, so we are given uh, the, the temperature. I think it didn't render here. So we've got the overall heat transfer coefficient and the area. Um, we, uh, let's see, I'm not sure why that didn't render in my, just going to check my code quickly. This is the wrong course. I'm looking at now. We are T, right? This one. So we're looking, I guess, here. And this is TA. And my code here TA. So it's in the question that we're not. Is T A pair but underscore. That's the problem, I think. T A yeah. Okay, let's try that again. The answers will change now, right? But anyway. Okay, so now it's giving us uh, the temperature here. So in this case, it's 600 Kelvin. So you see our heat transfer fluid is at 600 Kelvin. Notice the temperatures here. We are feeding A at about 400. Um, the temperature becomes 300. So it is cooling down. And, uh, and we are also trying to heat up so in this case, it's an endothermic reaction. So we are trying to heat up. So in this problem, uh, it's not a cooling jacket, it's a heating jacket, if you like. So we are trying to overcome that the, uh, the reaction tends to consume heat. We are trying to restore heat. We are trying to add thermal heat into the reaction mixture. And when we do that, we can see we do get a much higher conversion. So this was without the addition of heat. And when we add heat, we get a much higher conversion there. So uh, this, in a sense, supports the notion that 
adding heat to the system significantly changes the extent of the reaction. Okay, any questions or comments there? Okay, then uh, the next part. So here we see we've got addition of heat. And in this case, we are talking about uh, freedom. You've unmuted. You have a question there. I uh, guess not. Okay. Um, so we've got here, uh, that's addition of heat in a CSTR. Um, now let's think about a plug flow reactor. So if we think about our energy balance, right, we've done quite a lot of work to get it to the stage. Yes, I just want to call this. Okay, uh, please go ahead. Uh, you've muted again. Okay, on the first question, just to frame. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a question. Okay. On the first question, here we go. On the on the first, yeah, on that first question, so I just wanted to uh, make it CPA at every scenario where we have to do like that, or there is a scenario where we actually substitute uh, the value of that uh, theta i. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I see you. You really don't like this theta today, freedom. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, uh, there might be multiple uh, reactants, and uh, you would uh, you would you you do need to know the flow rate. So if you do have other reactants entering the reactor, if you look at some of the other problems where we had other reactants, or sometimes we even have an inert, um, we do need to know what the flow rates coming into the reactor uh, are. And then you would go ahead and, and just divide. So if you know FB in is 100 and FA in is 50, then 100 over 50 is 2. So for B, it would be 2. So you would just go ahead and use the, the flow rates coming in, and you, you can calculate these thetas. So this is not at all a, a difficult thing. We just It's just taking ratios of flow rates there. Does that cover it, Freedom? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, yeah I, I understand. And last question is, what is the difference with PI? What is the, I must that? The heat capacity. The heat capacity. The heat See, capacity. Um, yeah, there is a. Yeah, so. The CPI, yeah. then right hand side, CPA. Yes, I want to the difference. So. Of course, uh, for each component, you've got a different heat capacity and uh, we are multiplying by theta i here. So if only a is entering, then you only have a non-zero theta for a. So that means you're multiplying one by the heat capacity of a. So that heat capacity of a is given in the question. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. The heat. Capacity here, the heat capacity of component A. So we were given the heat capacity. And if you look at this, um, we are only going to need that heat capacity. Uh, was that what you were asking there, Freedom? Yes, I think it's clear. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. So let's go. So we're starting now to look at the plug flow reactor. And we said we've done all this work on this energy balance. And let's think of a quick way to use our development uh, in plug flow. Of course, we did make the assumption that when we wrote this balance, uh, this was for a reactor uh, that was perfectly mixed. Um, so the temperature was the same everywhere. Well, that really applied around here. But anyway, the exit temperature was the reactor temperature. What we can do instead is think about, uh, 
Okay, let's make a new drawing here. So let's think about, um, just gonna reuse this. So let's think about a reactor where we have Second. So let's think about this case. You've got your tube here. So this is your PFR tube. And we could simply take a, a differential space in there. So if we take, for instance, uh, a point, uh, a, a small space like this. So in this reactor, if we just take a small space here, then we could we could imagine that within this space, the contents are perfectly mixed and a certain temperature applies here. We do acknowledge that temperature is changing down this tube. So for instance, in the first problem we had, it was endothermic. And so if it's endothermic, then we expect that the temperature is going to do something like this. So let's say this was how temperature was varying axially down the tube. So we have something like this. Um, it, because it's an endothermic reaction, the temperature is going to drop as we look down the tube. But within a small space here, we can define one temperature. It, it does change slightly, but if, it's, if we take a small enough delta Z, then uh, the temperature here can be regarded as one number. Then we would also have a jacket uh, around this reactor. So let's put in a jacket here. So there's our jacket sitting around the reactor. And as the jacket uh, fluid flows along here, it uh, in general, it has different temperatures at different points along this. Remember, of course, the reactor has a lower temperature, it's endothermic. So the jacket temperature uh, that will, uh, or the jacket will, the fluid in the jacket will enter at a higher temperature because we are trying to add heat to the reactor. And then th that jacket temperature is going to drop as we look down the reactor because uh, the, the jacket is cooling due to the reaction as well. And we can say within our small space here, there exists a certain small area that applies, right? So we've defined a certain delta Z here. So that delta Z, uh, it, it tell, we can use that to work out the area that's in contact here. So there's a certain heat transfer rate that applies in this zone. And so we can look at our balance and say, well, all this applies at a certain interior position like that, that that balance can be applied here. It can be applied at another small section here and another small section there and so on. So if that's true, then uh, we can use this equation to develop our balance in the PFR case. And so the first thing uh, we'll do is just say, uh, let's first just think about it adiabatically. So if Q dot is zero, um, right? If there's no jacket and no heat being transferred, so that's zeroed out. And let's also ignore shaft work, right? In a PFR, we don't really think of, uh, of, of adding impellers and mixing things and, and all of that. So we can say that WS dot is also a zero, right? So both those are zeros, leaving us uh, just with this uh, equation. And then we get the adiabat as we saw last time. And uh, that will be the expression. Uh, well, that's the adiabat we saw last time. And then we can uh, substitute this here. Remember, we have the uh, material balance for our PFR. This still applies, of course, right? This, uh, this is still all valid. Uh, it's just that before we had assumed that the temperature was fixed. So the temperature hidden behind the kinetic rate constant here, uh, that was a considered fixed. Now we would say, well, uh, that constant K is going to vary with T 
and that t is going to vary with x according to this. So that tells us what to do here. Um, so that's uh, one part. The, then coming back to this assumption that there's no jacket, let's relax that. Let's say we do have a jacket. So if we've got a jacket around our PFR, then we would say locally at all points, we can define a temperature in the reactor and a temperature in the jacket, and that's the driving force uh, for heat transfer. So at each location, um, that is the driving force. And if we integrate over the entire surface between the jacket and the reactor, in other words, if we add up all the differential elements here, add up all the little DAs and the UA delta Ts, if we add them all together, that will give us the total heat transferred between the reactor and the jacket. Okay, so there's that. We can also say if this is a cylindrical tube, right? And most things in ChemEng are, I guess. Uh, then we can say if we take a delta Z basis, that the area divided by the volume is going to be, so the area, the inside area, the heat transfer area, it's two pi R delta Z, right? So you imagine the inside curved surface of the cylinder, that's uh, the area. And then the volume is going to be the cross-sectional area, pi r squared, and the axial distance, delta z. And we can see the delta z's cancel, the pi cancels, the r cancels, and we're left with 2 over r. So that's our a over v. So if we've got dA here, we can say dA equals 2 over r dv. So we can rewrite this, in which is in terms of area, we can rewrite that in terms of volume. And we are doing that because, uh, of course, we are integrating in volume. Uh, I mean, in our PFR, we know we like... Okay, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm unmuted there. Uh... Okay, can you hear me? Uh, were you hearing me <laughs> the last minutes now? I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, did we lose connection? Uh, can you tell me if uh, yeah. did we lose connection for the last few minutes? Connection, Sorry? Kind of, lost, kind of lost connection. No, there was no sound. Oh, okay. Uh, for how many minutes was that? Two to three minutes, approximately. Two minutes, somewhere, yes. About three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah, maximum. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, so you were watching me just point at the screen for some time there. Um, so what I was saying here was, uh, this was the energy balance that we have. So this is the adiabat for a PFR. And then in that PFR, uh, by the way, uh, can you see my screen? Let's see. I just need to. Oh, we can't see your screen. We can't see your screen, sir. Okay. Only hear the voice. Okay. Okay. You yeah. Can see my screen again. Right. So I'm looking here, and we're looking at the plug flow reactor, and we're saying that. Uh, we want to apply our um, our energy balance. We don't want to repeat everything we've done to develop this uh, energy balance. We did a lot of work to get the energy balance to this point. So what we would rather do is draw um, a finite volume. And so within this finite volume, um, the contents here are well mixed. Right? Remember, that was the feature of the PFR that we could define short sections and in those short sections, we considered the fluid to be well mixed. So if that's the case, then this balance can apply because this was developed uh, for a well mixed reactor. So we take this and now we acknowledge this is the balance that applies uh, for the PFR um, in, in short sections like this. Um, the other thing, uh, this part just talks about the adiabat again, uh, so that uh, we've already talked about before. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying here is we know for a PFR, this is the material balance, right? Remember for the PFR, we had dx, dv, 
F A N equals uh, R A. So this we had uh, used to find the volume of a PFR, but we had assumed that the temperature was the same everywhere. Now we know that uh, right, there's a temperature dependence uh, through the K, the kinetic rate constant, and we can connect the temperature there to the conversion through our energy balance. So now we would substitute uh, the temperature dependence here and we would get a single equation in X, right? At the moment, if we had just this equation, we would have two variables. There's an obvious X here and there's a hidden T, right? Behind the kinetic rate constant, there's a T. But now because we have the energy balance, we can use this relationship to reduce this equation to one variable and then we can still solve it. So that's the advantage in the case of the, uh, yeah, the, that's part of the reason we want this energy balance. We want to reduce the number of variables uh, in solving our design. So, uh, so that's one. Um, and then all this was under the assumption that Q dot was, uh, was zero, that it's an adiabat. There's no uh, heat being transferred. Now let's relax that and let's say there is heat being transferred, that there's a jacket sitting around our reactor. And so within each short section here, there's a certain uh, heat transfer rate uh, across the walls there. So we can recognize that the total amount of heat transferred would be um, obtained by adding up the contributions. Oops by adding up the contribution from each of these short sections. So if you add up the, uh, the driving force and U uh, times delta T here and multiplied by the area of the short section, and then you did that repeatedly across the whole tube, then you would get the total heat that was transferred, right? And this area, we don't like to work with areas because we are used to working with volumes in a PFR. We notice that in terms of uh, cylindrical geometry, right, if we take a delta Z basis, that the area is of course going to be the inside curved area that would be the heat transfer area in the reactor. So two pi R delta Z, that's the area on that inside curved surface in the reactor. Then the volume of that space is going to be the cross-sectional area pi R squared times the axial distance delta Z. So that's the volume there. And we can see delta Z's cancel, the pi R cancels, leaving us with two over R. So instead of writing Q that in terms of dA, we can change the variable to dV if we include the two over R here. So that's Q dot now written in terms of uh, dV. And uh, and so we can take this back in our energy balance. So we substitute for the Q dot there. We still don't bother with shaft work. We, we aren't really adding stirring inside a PFR, right? So we say WS is zero and now our Q dot is expressed in V. So here's our Q dot. And remember this was our FA in HA in minus FA out, HA out. Uh, so we have that term still, and we had the reaction term also. So this is nothing but the energy balance written in the context of the PFR. And now if we differentiate this balance, right? We don't like this integral here. This is not the form we are used to seeing. So let's get rid of this integral by differentiating this whole balance um, with respect to V. So if we differentiate in V, then we'll just get the kernel of this integral. So that's the kernel there. And then we have to differentiate this with respect to V. If we look at this, uh, at these terms, this is constant. This refers just to the inlet point. So that doesn't change with the volume. Also your inlet temperature can't change with the volume. Your exit temperature will change with volume. So this whole expression, uh, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take this as a constant of differentiation, and then we have to differentiate uh, that temperature. So, so that's the one that gets differentiated there. So that's the second term taken care of. When we look at the third term, 
we see fa in we know that's a constant that's at the inlet point and then we've got x we know x is going to vary with v and then we've got delta hr and often we made that approximation delta hr is equal to delta h standard but uh, if we are not making that approximation then this is also going to vary with v because temperature is going to vary with v so we leave that as uh, ddv of x delta hr Okay, so that's uh, the form of the balance. And now we can see we have a dt dv that we can integrate. Uh, we still don't like this part here. So let's expand it out. So if we uh, expand this derivative, right, you've got two functions in t. So it's both are going to vary with v. So we can say this is equal to delta hr uh, dx dv plus x d dv of delta hr. And of course, dx dv, we can get from our material balance. Remember our material balance here, that still applies. So we can get dx dv from this. And then, um, and then we've got dt dv as well. Now this dt dv, uh, remember all this is from the third term. It's, it's all from here. We also have a dt dv over here. So let's just group the dt dvs. So the dt dv, we take this first part here. So we, we group that in. And then we are getting this extra uh, bit here from, uh, from this part of the derivative. So we can just uh, group this in here. So we group the dt dv terms together and we just carry over this uh, uh, delta hr dx dv. And of course, this needs to be multiplied by Fa in as well. So that's what you get there. So that's how our energy balance looks um, in the PFR. And uh, here, um, we, we can get rid of this dx dv, right? We don't like an equation where we've got two dependent variables, right? T and x are dependent variables. V is an independent variable. So we can get rid of one of the dependent variables, uh, just as we said earlier, through the material balance. We know from the material balance, Fa in dx dr is equal to uh, minus Ra. So there's a minus there. So we've got delta hr Ra. Okay, and this term makes sense to us. This is uh, the thermal energy that's trans transferred due to reaction. Right, and so now this is a nice equation in dt dv, and we can, if we want, we can rewrite it like so. Okay, so that's dt dv for a PFR, and that's dx dv also for that PFR. We can see on both sides, we need x and t, right? Uh, in dt dv, you've got Ra that does depend on temperature, and it depends on the conversion through the concentration. Um, you can see explicitly we need an X here. We also need T explicitly here. So this uh, does need X and T in dt dv. Also for dx dv, Ra does need uh, T and X. So we need to solve both these equations simultaneously. Okay, any questions or comments there? Okay, now we have a, a nice exercise here. So it's, uh, again, we have this first order reaction. Uh, we are feeding pure A again at this temperature and we are given the heat of reaction and we want to know about the heating jacket. Yeah, so we, we are adding a heating jacket. The reactor, Geometry is given this time. So we are given the diameter, uh, something like 2.1 centimeters and a length of eight meters, long, thin reactor. And then the heat capacity of A is given again. Your, uh, yeah, again, I, I can see that error is there. I need to uh, re-render that. Um, but yeah, you've got, you've got all the specs here. So we want to know what's the conversion Right, and we know this is uh, not such a straightforward uh, uh, thing to calculate because it is going to involve integrating two ODEs here. So what we can do, if we look at what I'm suggesting here so far, 
Uh, number one, uh, yeah, just copying the two equations that we know we want to solve. And then because it's a first order reaction in this problem, we can rewrite the RA term like this. So it's KCA. And now we are acknowledging the temperature dependence of uh, K. And for CA, it's CA naught one minus X, right? So that's our RA. So we're going to substitute for RA and RA. Um, we are taking, uh, it does say in the problem, the heat of reaction is approximately constant. So that means we can ignore this delta CP part. So this term we can just uh, forget about, right? This term down here. Um, and the feed is pure A again. So that delta CP, uh, this theta CP, uh, that freedom doesn't like, uh, we can simplify this. Uh, so the energy balance looks like this then, right? The denominator simplifies to this form and uh, our heat of reaction part uh, we substitute for there. And then here's the material balance part. Here's the reaction rate, KCA. And here's our uh, inlet flow rate. So now we have two equations. They are two ODEs, and uh, we do need the initial conditions. So of course, your inlet conversion is zero, and your inlet temperature is T in. So you have initial conditions. And then we can integrate these using um, finite differences, for instance. So we would substitute the inlet values here and calculate numbers for dx dv and dt dv. And then uh, we would choose a certain amount to step forward by. I'm suggesting down here to, uh, to write it in terms of z, uh, in terms of v, because we are given a nice length, right? Eight meters. And the problem does suggest using at most three points in the integration. So you would choose delta Zs, you would evaluate dx, dz, and dt, dz, and step forward, and you would get your solution. So we're out of time now, but we'll continue this uh, during our tutorial tomorrow. So, uh, but that basically closes this part. Um, we have our balances for the energy for the PFR and the, the material balance still applies. So we'd be able to integrate this uh, set of equations and get our solution there. Uh, any questions or comments there? Uh, say. Go ahead. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask on the cause outline. It's not... Uh... It's not on the notes of today, but what are the main class assignments, sir? Um, that's, uh, in fact, in these things, uh, even like the, this question, you, you submit your answers to these questions. So all these little questions that you get in all these notes, um, those are considered your money assignments. Okay. And thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask, um, is there any indication as to when we will revert to where we will be able to go back to campus and actually do and actually do lectures on site? Because I've been hearing from a few colleagues of mine that things have quite down on campus. So I was just wondering when we'll be able to revert back. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard anything um... Yeah, I, I really don't know when. I am seeing students on campus and uh, and all that, so I'm hoping it will be soon. I also much prefer being uh, in person there. Uh, besides even just losing time like we did this morning, it was, uh, I, I feel it's just much better in, in terms of working with the class. So I'm also just waiting for that. Uh, but at the moment, there's, there's no indication. And, and so at the moment, we are instructed to continue online. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, uh, we'll close it there. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thank <laughs>
Okay, bye everyone.